three, six, seven, nine, twelve, Okay, good. More than 60 here. Good, that's very good. Okay, we are ready for Judges 19, I believe. Is that not right? Judges 19. Uh, some of you have asked, and so let me take just a minute to tell you. Uh, I don't know. I guess most of you know what I'm talking about here. But uh, yesterday was the Buddy Walk. Y'all have heard it talked about in announcements here. Uh, the Buddy Walk is to raise money for uh, Down Syndrome research. We have a great grandson, Linda and I do, who is almost exactly one year old. In fact, had his first birthday party not long ago, and he has Down Syndrome. His name is Wyatt, Wyatt Burns. He lives in uh, Lewisburg. But anyway, uh, we were very fearful that it was going to be cold and, and rainy and whatnot yesterday. But in the first place, the Lord blessed us with a beautiful day. Uh, it was cold early on, as you recall. So we dressed very, very warmly. But uh, by the time we got over there and got everything set up, it was, it was already warm and good. And the count, we don't know exactly how many People were there, but I think the first figure that came in last night that Linda saw was over 3,000 people were there. Uh, we took up probably as much, maybe more now than then, a quarter of a million dollars for this, you know, Down syndrome research and so on. But uh, we had... Uh, you, you go in and you, you bring one of those tents, you know, that has no sides to it. And uh, you all sit under that tent in case it's raining, which it wasn't. And everybody brought food and whatnot. So it's kind of like a picnic, really. And families get under the tents. And we had 25 people uh, for, from Wyatt's family. So we appreciated all of that. But it was a good day. It's over at the Hermitage, and you park in a parking, a well, pasture actually, is where you park, and then you've got to unload everything in your car. And Linda almost literally took everything but the kitchen sink. I'm not kidding you. So it was Linda and Cindy and myself. Cindy's our daughter, in case you don't know her, uh, in our car, and then other people in their cars. But Linda and Cindy and I, with a little help from Megan, Megan is our granddaughter, that's why it's mom, uh, unloaded our car. I'm telling you, we had a table, uh, we had chairs, food, you name it, we had it. But it was a great day, and I, I know several of you contributed to that, and I appreciate that. I know that many of you showed an interest in it and asked about it, and I'm sure you prayed for it. And uh, we're just, we're, we're very thankful. And so I just, I thought you might want to know that somebody had just asked me that very thing. So I thought I didn't take time to uh, talk about it during the service. So I thought you might want to know that. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we are thankful for this beautiful day that we're having today. We're thankful for the privilege of being able to be here to worship. We are thankful for the study of your word and for the story of the judges. And we pray as we begin to draw this study to a conclusion that it will have blessed our lives, that it will have blessed this church, and that some way what we learn from these lessons will have blessed or will bless even our country. Bless all of us according to your will and be with us and may we be used in your service and to your glory and to the salvation of souls, we pray through Christ. Amen. Now we're going to cover 19 hopefully today and maybe even a part of 20 and we only have 21 chapters so we're winding this thing down and uh, I think we will probably get through it a little early but we'll talk about that later. So 19.1. Now, notice what you've got in 19.1. Uh, 
You've already come across it in 17.6. Now in 18.1, I believe it was, wasn't it? And then again in 21.25, you'll come across it. But here it is in part in 19.1. It came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. If you go back to uh, chapter, what is it, 18? Yeah. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and so on. That just gets done repeatedly. But I think the best statement of that is over in the very last verse, chapter 21, verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Now, here's the problem. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's... That's basically the problem today. Do your own thing. What's right is what's right for me. There are various versions of that statement going around. Some of them a little bit too crude to discuss in public, I would think. But that's the attitude. Everything is relative. Nothing is absolute. No absolute laws, no absolute standards of morality or decency or anything else. And so times have changed greatly from the days of the judges, but times have not changed in the sense that the same problems are still here. So 19.1. There was no king in Israel, and there was a certain Levite staying in remote mountain, in the remote mountains of Ephraim, and he took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. Now remember, we think that these last four or so chapters are attached on to the book of Judges as an appendix. And that they really describe what times were like in Israel after the death of Joshua and before the first of the Judges was appointed... And then as we've worked our way through Judges, we've seen that here is a a time where a, a judge rules and things go pretty well and the judge dies and it's a while before there's another judge and you've got this gap in here where standards just deteriorate right and left. So that's kind of what's happening here. We're still in that appendix section. We'll be in it until we get through with the book of Judges. And here is a certain fellow who is a Levite. He's from that priestly tribe. And he takes a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. Now, later on, as I read through and tried to study this, later on, this concubine will be referred to as his wife. But anyway, his concubine played the harlot against him and went away from him to her father's house in Bethlehem and Judah, and was there for whole months. Now, I think the progress of events here is that she first of all played the harlot, then she left the husband, or the husband, or whatever he was, kicked her out. And so now she's been separated from him for four whole months, okay? And then verse 3 calls this Levite her husband. Her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. By bring her back, he means bring, the writer means bring her back to him. And we think that the writer of the book of Judges was probably Samuel. Okay. Having his servant and a couple of donkeys with him. So she brought him into her father's house. It appears that she welcomes him. It appears that they have reconciled, or that's what's going on. And when the father of the young man saw him, he was glad to meet him. Apparently had not before. He's glad to see the young Levite as well, probably because he knows the Levite's there to take her back with him. Now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him, and he stayed with him three days. So they ate and drank and lodged there. 
Then it came to pass on the fourth day that they arose early in the morning, and he stood to depart. But the young man's father, the young woman's father, I'm sorry, said to his son-in-law, Refresh your heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go your way. Before you leave, let's have lunch. Then after lunch, you can go ahead and leave. All right, but that doesn't work out that way, does it? So they sat down, and the two of them ate and drank together. Then the young woman's father said to the man, Please be content to stay all night and let your heart be merry. Stay on at least one more night. He'll stay more than that before it's over with. But stay one more night and let's have a little something else to eat and maybe a little something else to drink. When the man stood to depart, his father-in-law urged him, so he lodged there again. Now, he arose early in the morning on the fifth day. Now, if I count right, a couple of days and nights have come and gone. He's going to make ready to depart. And the young man, the young woman's father, I keep calling her a man, said, please refresh your heart. So they delayed until afternoon and both of them ate. They're spending a lot of time eating together, aren't they? That's supposed to bind them. When the man stood to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the young woman's father, said to him, Look, the day is now drawing toward evening. Please spend the night. See, the day is coming to an end. Lodge here that your heart may be merry. Tomorrow go your way early so that you may get home. Spend one more night with me. Okay. However, things change. The man was not willing to spend that night. So he rose and departed and came to opposite Jabus, that is Jerusalem. The area that is Jerusalem is being called Jabus in this verse because the Jebusites have taken control of the city. So in doing that, they apparently have changed the name from Jerusalem to Jabus. So he rose and departed. He came to Jabus, that is Jerusalem, and with him were the two saddle donkeys. His concubine was also with him. Now according to Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10, he had the right under some circumstances to take her back. Some have even implied that he should have taken her back because he's the guilty party. But that doesn't seem to be the case. It says in verse 2, the concubine played the harlot against him. Okay, whatever's going on, they were near Jabus and the day was far spent. And the servant said to his master, come please, let us turn aside into the city of the Jebusites, there they are, and lodge in it. But his master said to him, We will not turn aside here into a city of foreigners. It's now occupied by the Jebusites, who are not the children of Israel. We will go on to Gibeah. All right. The Jebusites are not Jews. So foreigners really do occupy the city. So he said to his servant, Come, let us draw near to one of these places and spend the night in Gibeah or in Ramah, which are not that, too, not that far apart. And they passed by and went their way. And the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. So they turned aside there to go in to lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat down in the open square of the city. Now remember, there's probably a gate leading into and out of this city. It was a place where men hung out, pardon the term. It was a place where business was conducted. It was a place where topics of all kinds were discussed like politics, the weather, the ball game scores, whatever they talked about in that day. And I think the last time we talked about this, uh, these folks over here from Henderson will remember. Did y'all ever go down to the court square? No, never have. Okay. 
You go down to the court square, and uh, they got the courthouse, and they got a lawn uh, in front of the courthouse. And uh, the guys sitting down there, retired or out of a job or just taking the day off or whatever, are either playing checkers or dominoes. I never did see any of them playing poker or any high-class card game like Canasta or even Rook. But anyway, whatever they're playing, and they're, they're playing, and they're smoking, and they're chewing, and they're talking about uh, the president, and the weather, and the economy, and like I say, the ball scores, and whatever. That's kind of the thing you've got here. Not quite, but it's kind of similar. It's the place where everybody hangs out. So here they are hanging out. He sits down in the open square of the city as if to say, somebody invite me home. But nobody does. No one would take them into his house to spend the night. Just then, an old man came in from his work in the field at evening, who also was from the mountains of Ephraim. Okay, we've got a common territory here. Whereas, no, I'm sorry. He was staying in Gibeah, whereas the men of the place were Benjamites. And when he raised his eyes, he saw the traveler in the open square of the city. And the old man said to the young guy, where are you going and where do you come from? You meet somebody new? That's not an uncommon question. Before in my life, but he's got some attachment to the family. So, after I found out his name... I asked him, where do you live? After I asked him that, I said, what kind of work do you do? You know, it's just common questions you would ask anybody. Where are you going and where do you come from? So we said to him, we're passing from Bethlehem in Judah toward the remote mountains of Ephraim. I am from there. I went to Bethlehem in Judah. Now I am going to the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord probably here means Shiloh, where the ark is at this point. Could mean, what was the other city? I forget now, I'm skipped my mind. But this is probably Shiloh, where the house of the Lord is located. But there is no one here in Gibeah who will take me into his house to spend the night. Now, in verse 19, the young Levite wants uh, this fellow talking to him, the old man. He wants him to know, we're not going to bum off of you. This is not freeloading, let me tell you. Although we have both straw and fodder for our donkeys and bread and wine for myself, for your female servant and for the young man who is with your servant, there is no lack of anything. We just need a place to spend the night. And the old man said, Peace be with you. However, let all your needs be my responsibility. I'll feed you. I'll give you a place to stay, a bed to sleep in. I'll take care of you. I'll be a good host. Let all your needs be my responsibility. Only do not spend the night in the open square. And the reason he's saying that last part about don't spend the night in the open square is because the old man knows that's a pretty dangerous place to be overnight, especially by yourself or even with those people who are with you. So what you need to do is come on home with me. And so the young man concedes that I'll do that. Verse 21 says, So he brought him into his house, and watch what he does. He gives fodder or food to the donkeys. They wash their feet, which was an act of hospitality. Isn't it in John 13 where Jesus washes the disciples' feet? Washed their feet, they ate and they drank because the old man was a hospitable fellow. As they were enjoying themselves, oh my, it's going to get pretty rough from here on out. Suddenly, certain men of the city. Now, my Bible says they were perverted men. And I have a footnote, and the footnote simply says they were sons of Belial. 
And as we read on further, you understand exactly what the problem is. These perverted men surrounded the house and beat on the door. Sounds like Lot at Sodom and Gomorrah, doesn't it? They spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came to your house. My Bible puts it that we may know him carnally. And carnally is italicized, and I'm not sure exactly what the Hebrew word there would state. Burton Kaufman, in his commentary, makes this comment about what's going on here. There's hardly ever, he says, a more tragic episode than this. Well, there have been some others like it, haven't there? So, but the man, verse 23, the master of the house went out to them and said to them, No, my brethren, I beg you, do not act so wickedly. Seeing this man has come into my house, do not commit this outrage. Look, here is my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Let me bring them out now. Humble them and do with them as you please. But to this man, do not do such a vile thing. Now, the man is willing to give his virgin daughter. He is even willing to give the Levite's concubine. And the ones who comment on this make the comment that one of the reasons this is done, that the women were offered, is to confirm what we know about this time in the history of the world, that the woman just did not have very high standing. So, you know, better I give you the women than you defile the man. Verse 25, but the men would not heed him. So the man took his concubine. Now, it says the man took his concubine. That makes it sound like the Levite is taking his concubine, the one who would be referred to as his wife, because she's referred to him as her husband. But some of the commentators who know the Hebrew language say that this is the old man who is their host who is taking the concubine that belongs to the young man, I'm not sure which is which, and brought her out to them, and they knew her and abused her all night until morning. And when the day began to break, they let her go. She was too weak to stop them. The old man, the young man, seemed to do nothing to try to stop them. Verse 26. Then the woman came as the day was dawning and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master, that's the same as her husband was, till it was light. When her master, her husband, arose in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. I think that's an interesting term. Does he say, where's my concubine? Does he say, where's my wife? No, he's just going to come out and get his belongings and leave, it looks like. Okay, he opened the doors of the house, went out to go his way. There was his concubine fallen at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. Now, uh, I read Kaufman, I read Kyle and Delish, and both of them seem to agree, and Kyle and Delish would be much more accurate probably, with all due respect, than Brother Kaufman. But uh, uh, I think these, these, these folks agree that this woman's dead. She's already dead. But watch what he does. He said to her, get up and let us be going. But there was no answer. So the man lifted her onto the donkey. And the man got up and went to his place back to his home. He initially finds her on the step, doesn't realize she's dead, tells her to get up, we've got to go, and only then discovers that in fact she has already given up her life. I want to read you something. This came from a commentator by the name of Halverson. He's writing about this very thing we've just looked at. And here's what he says. He, 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 he pulls no punches. He minces no words. He calls this episode 
the sewer of Scripture. The sewer of Scripture. He goes on. The most disgusting story in the Bible. Well, there are several of those, aren't there? Repelled by them, she was. Could not find any help from them. She found none. And he says, as you read this, repelled by the story and the actions of these people, he goes on to say, you cannot help feeling rather dirty. Because what has happened has been just repulsive. It's been everything wrong and nothing right about it at all. But anyway, here she is now. Kaufman says in his commentary, uh, he's referring to the statement in 27. There was his concubine fallen at the door with her hands on the threshold. Kaufman says, there is not a more pathetic line in the entire Old Testament. That's saying quite a bit. All right, go back to 29. <laughs> We're not through with this. When he entered his house, that's after he gets home. He's carried this dead concubine with him home. He took a knife, laid hold of his concubine, and divided her into 12 pieces. Now, my Bible says... Uh, limb by limb, the footnote says, with her bones. He cut her up with her bones intact, I reckon. And sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. Now here's your concubine or wife, whichever you want to call her. She's dead. She's been abused and murdered. And now he takes her corpse and he cuts it into 12 parts and send them, sends them throughout all the territory of Israel. Why would he have done that? He's using her body, pieces of her body, as a rallying cry against the men who have done what they have done. It's as if he has said to them by sending those parts, see what they have done to my concubine. What they have done is wrong and we've got to get even with them by punishing them for what they did to her. Okay. So you come down to verse 30. And so it was that all who saw it said, no such deed has been done or seen from the day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt until this day. Now here's his message. Consider it. Confer, speak up, talk about it, get together. Let's decide what we want to do to these men for what they did to the concubine. That's what he's doing. That's the message. Okay, you go right into 20. So all the children of Israel came out from Dan to Beersheba. Have you ever heard that expression? Is that the kind of an expression your grandmother might have used? From Dan to Beersheba. I've heard it all my life. You probably have too. Dan is in the northernmost part of the area. Beersheba is in the southernmost part. So you've got from the northernmost to the southernmost part. You've got all the children of Israel coming out from Dan to Beersheba. As well as from the land of Gilead. And the congregation gathered together as one man before the Lord at Mizpah. And the leaders of all the people, all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God. Now, here's the number of men who are willing to go fight. 400,000 foot soldiers who drew the sword. Whatever differences they may have had at any other time, they are united together in, in, in punishing the people have done this terrible wrong. Verse 3. Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel had gone up to Mizpah. Then the children of Israel said, Tell us, how did this wicked thing happen? So the Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, the concubine, answered and said, My concubine, there it is, and I went into Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin, to spend the night. Belongs to Benjamin. Notice that. 
And the men of Gibeah arose against me and surrounded the house at night because of me. They intended to kill me, but instead they ravished my concubine so that she died. So I took hold of my concubine, cut her in pieces, and sent her throughout all the territory of the inheritance of Israel because they committed lewdness and outrage in Israel. Look, all of you are children of Israel. Give your advice and your counsel here and now. So all the people arose as one man saying, None of us will go to his tent, nor will any turn back to his house. They're not going to go home. But now this is the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up against it by lot. They're not going to take all of the men. They're going to, pardon the term, draw straws. They're going to pick. Certain men are going to go, certain men are not. We will take, here's the game plan. We will take ten men out of every hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel. A hundred out of, out of every thousand, a thousand out of every ten thousand, to make provisions for the people, that when they come to Gibeah and Benjamin, they may repay all the vileness, that's their plan, that they have done in Israel. Somebody said, they're going to get an army. They're going to select men to be quartermasters. Some of you in the military, you know about the quartermaster corps. They're going to get men who are serving as quartermasters to make sure that these men who are going to be fighting in this war have got ample provisions of weapons and food and so on to fight the battle successfully. Verse 11. So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, united together as one man. Then the tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What is this wickedness that has occurred among you? Making sure that the crime is confirmed, that the thing really happened. Now therefore deliver up the men, the perverted men who are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and remove the evil from Israel. But the children of Benjamin would not listen to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. They refused to give them up. Instead, the children of Benjamin gathered together from their cities to Gibeah. They're joining forces with the people of Gibeah to go to battle against the children of Israel and kill them rather than give up the perverted men. And from their cities at that time, the children of Benjamin numbered 26,000 men who drew the sword. Besides the inhabitants of Gibeah who numbered 700 select men. So you've got 26,000 plus 700. Among all this people were 700 select men. Now this is an interesting thing. They were all left-handed. Everyone could sling a stone at a hair's breadth and not miss. What's the deal? Uh, we just got through watching the World Series. In the World Series, some of the best pitchers that ever took the, man, took the mound were left-handed. Is that what we're talking about here? I don't know, but here's what Kyle and Delish say. These men were all, according to them, lame in their right hand. They could not use their right hand to fight. I've got a finger right there that apparently uh, arthritis has taken up its permanent abode. And when somebody grabs this shaking hand too hard, uh, some of you probably noticed that I wince. Yeah, it hurts. It's not as bad as it was, but when I do something stupid like this, which I shouldn't be doing, that's why it's stupid. If I do that, it's going to hurt. All right. So here these guys are, according to the scholars, they're lame in their left hand. But now they have compensated by that, for that, by being able to sling a stone at a hair's breadth, no matter how far, and not miss. Go back to baseball. They always tell you that pitcher on the mound, how fast that pitch was. It was 82 miles an hour. 
It was 97 miles an hour. It was 103 miles an hour. Okay, so here are guys who can take a stone, put it in a sling. I guess you do like this and sling that thing. And there's no telling how fast it's going when it whacks the other guy in the head. David and Goliath? Yeah, okay. So then, they would not miss. Now verse 17. Besides Benjamin, the men of Israel numbered 400,000 men who drew the sword. All of these were men of war. Then the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God to inquire of God. It's kind of interesting. They've already made the plan. Now they're going to see if God's going to give it their approval. And again, it's, uh, there's some question as to whether the house of God here means Bethel or Shiloh. They said, which of us shall go up first to battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord says, Judah's going first. Okay. So the children of Israel rose in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. They're all equipped. They've got their soldiers. They've got their quartermaster corps. They've got everything they need to fight a successful battle. Verse 21. Then the children of Benjamin came out of Gibeah, and on that day cut down to the ground 22,000 men of the Israelites. The Israelites lost. But the battle's not over. This is the first day. Verse 22. And the people, that is the men of Israel, encouraged themselves... And again, form the battle line. And it's kind of like the battles, as I understand it, of the Civil War. The one group got on this side, the other group got on that side. They faced each other, and they shot at each other. And that's the way you fought battles back in that day. Uh, the guy that got killed the other day over in Syria, what was his name? You know who I'm talking about. There was no lining up in lines and shooting at each other, was there? How many helicopters? Six. How many commandos? A dozen or so. And they did something. It's terrible anybody has to die, but that guy was wicked and evil and otherwise. That's political. I better get off of that. The people, that is the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and again formed the battle line at the place where they had put themselves in array on the first day. They're going to keep fighting. Then the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until evening. And again comes, ask counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I or again, or shall we again, draw near for battle against the children of my brother Benjamin? And the Lord said, Go up against them. Keep on fighting. It's the second day now coming up of actual combat. So the children of Israel approached the children of Benjamin on the second day. Some think there's a gap of two or three days between the first day of the battle and the second day of the battle. Maybe. Benjamin went out against them from Gibeah on the second day and cut down to the ground 18,000 more of the children of Israel. All these drew the sword. Then all the children of Israel, that is all the people, went up and came to the house of God and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. They are mourning their defeat, number one. And number two, they're asking God for help. Verse 27, So the children of Israel inquired of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days, which makes you think this may have been Shiloh. And Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, Phinehas is a priest kin to Aaron, of course he would be, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of my brother Benjamin, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up. What's going to be different is tomorrow I'm going to deliver them into your hand. Now, we've got five more minutes. Then Israel set men in ambush. Now watch this. The number of times from here to the end of the chapter. How many times is going to talk about sending a certain contingent of men. Much like those commandos, but different in that they're going to set up an ambush. They're going to ambush these guys. Okay. 
Children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day, put them in battle array against Gibeah as at the other times. So the children of Benjamin went out against the people. They were drawn away from the city. Bad move on their parts. They began to strike down and kill some of the people as at the other times in the highways, one of which goes up to Bethel, the other to Gibeah, and in the field about 30 men of Israel. And the Benjamites, Benjaminites are saying, <laughs> just like the other days, we're going to beat the daylights out of these guys. They are defeated before as at first... And Israel says, let us flee and draw near and, and draw them away from the city to the highways. So all the, uh, the men of Israel rose from their place, put themselves in battle array, put some men in ambush, and burst forth from their position in the plain of Geba. 10,000 select men, the Benjamites came on the attack, they did not know the disaster that was upon them. The disaster was that the Lord that day defeated Benjamin before Israel. 25,100 Benjaminites, all these drew the sword. Okay. Well, we're not going to get to the end of the chapter. I'll tell you what, I've got a mark here anyway for some reason. We're going to stop... At chapter 20, verse 35. And we're going to start next week at chapter 20, verse 36. What's today? Today's the third. What will 3 and 7 be? 10. All right, this is for 11. See, this one I did so well in mathematics. You see how quickly I did that? <laughs> I did not do well in mathematics, by the way, so I'm just spoofing you. All right. Mm, okay, I'm trying to find my place. Here you go. We will finish chapter 20 next time, and we will do chapter 21, which is a very short chapter, and we will be through the study of Judges. Okay, let's pray. Father, we are thankful once again for this beautiful day and for the privilege of worship and Bible study. And we pray that our time spent together has been good in that we have worshipped and honored and praised you, our Father and our God, through your, Lord, your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now may we be more committed to be faithful to you, to do your will and to do your work that you might continue to be glorified. We pray through Christ. Amen. Thank you for being here. Don't forget we have singing tonight at 5.